not want to be lawbreakers. We want to be lawmakers. The only way is forward. I'm worth no more, no less than you. And we will win. I'd been thinking about um, the making a film about suffragettes for, for many years, actually, and I hadn't learnt any of it at school. I was aware that there'd never been a big screen version of the story, and it seemed like this incredible slice of history that had changed the course of history, in fact, these women and what they did, and we owed this debt to them. And it also seemed incredibly relevant. I was a bit resistant, because I was like, oh, big hats, corsets, tambourines, Mary Poppins, and... Um, it was a complete revelation when I came to read the research because it was incredibly diverse. It, was, it had been meticulously done so far in terms of what they had been able to find because obviously it's quite a buried history. But it, I became more and more excited and the thing that really excited me was a combination between the testimonials of the working women uh, and also the police surveillance records which had been opened up for public consumption from about 2002, 2003, which really exposed the level of intimidation and surveillance these women were under. And that's why I thought, OK, this feels very 21st century. Uh, Suffragette came into my life about six months, I guess, before we turned over. I was asked to go and have a cup of tea with Sarah Gavron, who was thinking about making a movie about suffragettes. Of course, I didn't know there'd been a huge journey for years for them <laughs> to get this film off the ground. Um, but she talked very briefly about the world she was trying to create, which totally inspired and engaged me, because I thought, what, we're going to be talking about working class women in the suffragette movement? That's very interesting, you know, because we have these preconceptions about these women with time on their hands. You know, it's a very reductive image of the cause that they were women who could afford to have a sort of hobby, you know. What we decided to do, after a long time of trying different routes, was to focus it in on this one year, 1912 to 1913, when militancy was at its height, and tell the story through working women. Could have made a biopic of Emmeline Pankhurst, who is the most extraordinarily compelling character, but that would have been a story of an extraordinary woman, and what we wanted was the story of the foot soldiers, of the working women, who were often at the vanguard of change in these movements and, and they were one of the striking things about the, the suffragette movement is it brought together women of all classes. We always look at the generals, we always look at the prime ministers, we always look at you know the great authors, we don't look at the people that read their books, we don't look at the soldiers who fight for that general line. And, uh, and so I just wanted to almost pay tribute to these voices that hadn't been heard. Many of the women in the working class were illiterate, you know there have been a couple of high-profile working-class women who did go on to write memoirs, Hannah Mitchell, Annie Kenny, but on the whole, the kind of everyday woman hadn't been written about, and the things that they were talking about, um, everything from equal pay to sexual violence and abuse in the workplace at home through to custodial and property rights, um, I kept on thinking, God, it, it, this is chiming with all the kind of global stories of inequality I'm reading. And, and so, in a weird way, although it took us six years, it was quite helpful, because I think the sort of world and we started to catch up and then run with each other. You a suffragette, Mrs Ellen? Yes, but I consider myself more of a soldier, Mrs Watts. These women's testimonies make a difference. Maybe. But as Mrs Panker says, it's deeds, not words, that will get us the vote. I think it felt very helpful in a story of this scale to have a character to see it through the eyes of primarily Maud, but also her cohorts, Violet, and um, played by Anne Marie, and Edith, played by Helena Bonham Carter, and then the women around her. But that, you know, what we could do is tell it on two planes. So have the um, the big historical beats, and then the tiny shifts in this one woman's life, and see how the two interacted, and understand um, this journey from quite a personal perspective, so that it it was less removed in a way. You feel that you're part of the team, and, and that was key, I think, to obviously making this film too, because it was about a team of people, you know, a movement of people. So Sarah really tapped into that. Um, she's so interested in your research and things you find out. 
and she really valued everybody's input, all the other departments. I mean, costume design, etc. on this film are great. This isn't a traditional costume drama vibe, you know. It's got a beautiful steely palette and our oh, costumes were just for, we were filthier. We, I was wearing a lot of original frocks that were just hanging by a thread, which was perfect, you know, and there was no glamour to it, which was appropriate. He's been here less than a month. And? I've been doing laundry work ever since I was 13. Maggie's only 12 and she's in here already. It's as tough for us women as it's ever been. We've got to do whatever we can, however we can. What, like smashing windows? It's not respectable. Mr. Angle, what's respectable? If you want me to respect the law, then make the law respectable. This film is a real marriage between you know, playing with these kind of this fictional journey and knowing when you cut away history and just let that go and allow the fictional journey to breathe in order to create a kind of authentic truth, even though it may not factually always be absolutely right, and actually um, respecting and honouring those great historical moments. And most of the time when we did that, it was because they were so dramatic in, in themselves. Abby is a really collaborative writer. She's brilliant at um, absorbing a lot of feedback and ideas and going back and reinventing the script endlessly and revisiting it and redrafting. And as we went along, we had a very close working relationship, the two producers, Abby and I, and we were constantly feeding off each other and, and shifting. And initially she wrote a script that was centred on the Romola Garay character, a sort of upper middle class woman. Um, and we, and, but she'd created this character of Maud and we read it and thought, oh, actually, Maud is the beating heart of this story. And so she went back and she rewrote the whole thing from Maud's perspective. Edith. Mrs P. Dear Emily. This is Mrs Watts, Mrs Pankhurst. Maud. Thank you, Maud. Never surrender. Never give up the fight. Recreating period London of 1912 isn't easy because lots of it was destroyed in the Blitz, particularly the areas that Maud would have lived in, the tenements, and also lots of it has been regentrified. So what we had to do was we combined visual effects with real locations. We were incredibly lucky to get access to the Houses of Parliament. I said to the location manager quite early on, we have to get in there. That was the epicentre of battles, you know, it's so key. She said, well, no, no film crew ever has, no commercial film crew, but we were lucky, I mean, partly her to and partly good timing that we did get access so we were able and then we put in this request to take in 300 supporting artists and stunt people and period cars and horses and stage an anti-government protest in the, you know in the very place that barred women for centuries and there we were this mainly female crew and cast doing that and it felt that felt very exciting recreating history in the place that happened and there's something about being in those real locations that adds a huge amount when you're shooting just to feel the presence of that building hanging over your head, to walk past sculptures inside the building that women had chained themselves to because there was a freedom of access at that point in history. One could wander in and out of the Houses of Parliament, which is extraordinary for us to imagine, but you could. Women chained themselves in. Emily Wilding Davis locked herself into the Houses of Parliament, you know, and we walked around and saw all those places, and you just feel so... Well, we just felt very beholden and very grateful, you know, but also, yeah, I mean, it just gets the old nerve endings going. You don't have to do too much to tickle your imagination on that one, you know. You're an hypocrite. I uphold the law. The law means nothing to me. I've had no say in making the law. That's an excuse. It's all we have. We break windows. We burn things. Because war's the only language men listen to. Because you've beaten us and betrayed us and there's nothing else left. And there's nothing left but to stop you. What are you going to do? Lock us all up? We're in every home, we're half the human race, you can't stop us all. You might lose your life before this is over. And we will win. It was a, a great atmosphere of camaraderie on the set, and in a way the subject matter made us feel quite fearless. You know, we felt like, well, the, su the suffragettes were out there breaking every taboo and every convention, so let's do it, you know. I hope that the film's a reminder of how far we've come you know, the debt we owe to these women in previous generations who paved the way for our generation, but also how far we still got to go. It was a constant reminder making it of how there are women around the world who are still fighting for basic human rights. Uh, there are also people in general who are fighting inequality, and I hope that this film speaks beyond just um, sexual inequality towards the need for equality in so many areas. Passion is a good thing. Passion leads to activism. Activism leads to change. Change led to the vote. Use your vote. 
you know, at its simplest. I think it's that sort of equation.